In one of the more notable instances of modern insurgency against British rule, the Cyprus Emergency of 1955 to 1959 sought to unseat the imperial rule of the UK over the sun-kissed Mediterranean holiday escape, turning what was a paradise jewel in the crown of the British Empire into an indiscriminate war zone that would ultimately destabilize the island and lead to its current division between Greek and Turkish rule. The island of Cyprus had existed as a colony of the Ottoman Empire since the 16th century, but became a protectorate of the United Kingdom under nominal Ottoman suzerainty from June 4, 1878, in the wake of the Russo-Turkish War. The nation was subsequently annexed by Britain from 1915, following the entry of the Ottoman Empire into World War I on the side of the Central Powers of Germany and Austro-Hungary, with the UK government even offering the country as a bribe to see Greece enter the wider conflict on their side, though this was ultimately turned down. Following the end of World War I, Cyprus was of little major value in terms of resources, with its most prominent mineral export being dwindling deposits of copper that were exploited by an American mining company, the proceeds of which kept the rural peasantry and professional and business class in reasonable comfort. The main importance of Cyprus to the British Empire was its strategic location in the eastern Mediterranean, where it not only provided a base that could keep a watchful eye on the Soviet Union, Turkey and Egypt, but also proved to be an ideal stopover for flights bound for the Middle East and Far Eastern colonies once RAF Nicosia had been established. Due to the comparative remoteness of Cyprus, little hardship was known among the population, which comprised a majority of Greek Cypriots who were at liberty to practice their orthodox religion, had effective control of primary and secondary education systems, and could choose between Greece and Britain for tertiary education. Meanwhile, the Turkish Cypriot minority were, in general, less well-educated, but often owned the land on which they practiced agriculture and ran many small businesses, any frictions existing between the Turkish and Greek factions being generally subdued, and there appeared to be an overtly social and harmonious relationship between these two island groups. Other minorities on Cyprus included Armenians, Coptic Christians, and other offshoots of the rich and varied Middle East and ethnic mix, together with a sizable contingent of residents from the British Isles fleeing the post-war austerity of a bankrupt country, seeking their fortune on an island free largely of the legislative constraints that hampered a large portion of free enterprise back home in the UK. All these were ruled by a governing class of administrators, policemen and technicians, appointed either permanently or on contract by the colonial office in London, who were answerable to the governor and comprised some Greek and Turkish Cypriots that were supported by a working infrastructure of locally employed public servants. Against the backdrop of a war-torn Europe at the end of World War II, Cyprus was a little piece of paradise and a much-loved retreat away from the woes of home, with expansions to Nicosia Airport to accommodate more commercial aviation, making it among the most popular tourist destinations, as it was, at most, only four hours from London, while more lavish Caribbean escapes were between eight and ten hours away. This ideal situation was sadly not to last as the 1950s dawned, with two individuals seeing the continued colonial presence of the British as something that needed to be removed from the island nation one being Archbishop Makarios, the ethnarch or head of the Greek Orthodox Church in Cyprus, and the other being Georges Grivas, a former officer in the Greek army. Makarios, as the charismatic traditional leader of the Greek Cypriot community on the island, enjoyed great prestige among the majority population, including members and supporters of a flourishing communist party, his motivations as a politically driven churchman being that Cyprus ethnically and historically belonged to Greece and that the British should relinquish their power at the first opportunity. The movement for Enosis, or Union with Greece, was a heavily contentious one that had no universal endorsement among the varied populations of Cyprus, as while the majority ethnic group supported his words, the commercial community who relied on British support, together with the Turkish minority on the island, strongly opposed the Archbishop's plans, the mainland Turks being considerably interested in the fate of their descendants on an island so close to their own coastline and were also adamantly opposed to any suggestion of Enosis. George Grivas, who was known for undertaking clandestine right-wing political activity in Greece, was a fervent ally of the Archbishop, and was thus enlisted to operate the military arm of the independence cause, while Makarios would be its political face, Grivas mustering a selection of paramilitary operatives, many of whom were veterans of World War II. This resulted in the creation of AOKA, the Ethniki Organosis Kiprion Agoniston, or the National Organization of Cypriot Fighters, with Grievous working under the codename Digenis, so named for the mythical acrite or border guard of ancient Byzantium known for his bravery, 
Aoka rapidly procuring second-hand weapons and explosives taken from stores dropped into Greece by the British Special Operations Executive during World War II, and was ready to begin his campaign against the UK administration. Aoka's terrorist war began on April 1, 1955, when a number of explosions took place in and around the government offices of the Cypriot capital city of Nicosia, though nobody was killed and no major damage was done, the British not taking this initial strike against them seriously, ignoring the information of their loyal Greek Cypriot police officers, and instead believing it to be a communist strike instigated by members of AKEL, a local Leninist organization. The truth was revealed when Aoka claimed responsibility, and thus began an era of severe distrust, suspicion and violence, as the right-wing nationalist organization sought to instill fear into both their opponents and the Greek Cypriot population they had declared themselves to serve. Any signs of opposition to Aoka by the Greek Cypriots, resulting in anonymous warnings, followed, if ignored, by assassination. Multiple killings throughout late 1955 soon got their point across, one example being a schoolteacher from mainland Greece being shot in the back while watching a film at the cinema with his fiancée, who had openly stated his preference for British rule over that of the Greek government. These assassinations rapidly bringing about an air of pervasive intimidation among the locals, who now feared that anyone could be a potential Aoka informer, and thus any opposition from this group was now well and truly silenced. Elsewhere, Cypriot policemen, including Turkish officers, were murdered by the Aoka, thus leading to anger amongst the Turkish community and confirmed their suspicions of Greek hostility towards them, ensuring the growth of the bitter intercommunal hatred that was to become a major element of the situation going forward. 1956 opened with a chorus of opposing political stances towards the prospect of Enosis, with the most vocal being Akel, who wished to see the removal of British rule and the creation of a self-sustaining left-wing government in Cyprus with no ties to mainland Greece, though once again, the much better equipped and more militaristic Aoka rapidly won their silence by way of assassination. Other factions, including the Turkish population, conceived no circumstance in which the British would surrender to the right-wing thugs of the Aoka, while the British, including both civilians and officials, sought to crush Aoka as soon as possible, a view furthered by the need to maintain a colonial presence in the eastern Mediterranean following the nationalization of the Anglo-French Suez Canal Company by Egyptian leader Gamal Abdel Nassar during 1957, which warranted a military response in the ultimately fruitless Suez crisis of that year. The Aoka continued to make things difficult, and even proved that they could potentially strike a highly deadly blow against British civilians if circumstances were in their favour, as demonstrated on March 3, 1956, when Skyways Limited Handley Page Hermes 4, Gulf Alpha Lima Delta Whiskey, was blown up on the ramp at Nicosia Airport by an Aoka time bomb. But due to the flight running 20 minutes late, the airliner was empty when the blast occurred. Its complement of 68 passengers and crew, mostly comprised of women and children, narrowly escaping their deaths. While on April 27th, an RAF Douglas Dakota was also destroyed on the ground by an Aoka bombing, but again with no casualties. However, by the end of 1956, the heavily outnumbered Aoka had been forced up into the mountains to the north of Nicosia, focusing their efforts on a guerrilla campaign that sought to keep all opposing factions, British or otherwise, in a constant state of anxiety. Efforts to combat Aoka by the British were mixed, with troops sent into the mountains to root out their strongholds, being comprised of either disinterested conscripts who performed their duty with little to no enthusiasm, or highly professional paras, marine commandos and guard squadrons that proved to be highly successful terrorist hunters, wiping out large portions of the Aoka leadership that were either killed or captured, including lead Aoka assassin Nikos Simpson. Grivas himself narrowly escaped a para patrol, but in his haste left behind a useful diary that implicated several other members of the Aoka command that were rounded up by the British army the terrorist group subsequently opting to construct subterranean hideaways, where for 1957 they consolidated their remaining forces while giving the outward impression that they had been defeated by the colonists, learning from their previous failures and working to rearm themselves during the lull of activity. On the political front, the British government, having tried unsuccessfully to negotiate some acceptable agreement with Archbishop Makarios, both directly and via the Greek government, decided any attempt to seek diplomatic resolution was futile and thus the Archbishop was put under house arrest in luxurious conditions at great expense to the British taxpayer. Other potential troublemakers, including the Bishop of Kyrenia, were arrested and exiled, though by this point, Aoka had been able to stack much of the administration with their supporters in order to try and incite further violence later down the line, with Greek nationalist teachers being placed in charge of nearly all secondary education so as to preach to their students a conviction 
that they were ethnically and culturally Greek, and had a responsibility to struggle for the return of Cyprus to the fatherland. This led to rallies being held in the Kyrenia Gymnasium in support of Aoka that caused student riots to erupt across the island at any time, the elders being unable to bring the youth into line due to the pervasive fear of assassination by Grievous's terrorist operatives. While the main terrorist faction of Aoka continued to rebuild itself in the mountains, the main face of their violent campaign against the British was now the students, with many of the more enterprising youth members looting dynamite from the American copper mine at Amiandos so as to create improvised pipe bombs. However, due to their lack of experience with explosives, the students were more prone to blowing themselves up rather than any targets, and their attempted assault on British installations and personnel were nothing more than a minor nuisance. 1957 saw the Aoka reduced to a low-lying operation, with resupply being provided by smuggling operations along the island's lengthy coast, or was hidden in luggage aboard airliners arriving at Nicosia Airport as processed by Aoka-friendly baggage handlers. Despite the Suez Crisis resulting in a reduction of military forces on Cyprus as hostilities declined, the number of troops still stationed on the island was enough to deter any significant assault by the organization in its weakened state against British interests. The Power Brigade and Marine Commandos, using their sweeps of the mountains for Aoka hideouts, as a good exercise for training in preparation for more significant future conflicts. However, the terrorist elite continued to evade capture through their underground bases, this status quo continuing until 1958, after which the Aoka, now rearmed and reorganized, felt secure in their abilities to resume their campaign, leading to occasional ambushes throughout the year against security force patrols and assassinations of unwary and often unarmed British-looking civilians. These attacks, though, didn't always go to plan with the Aoka agents often underestimating the strength of the British patrols and were thus easily outgunned, while in one instance, an assassination on what was believed to be British tourists did in fact result in the murder of two members of the American Foreign Service, which invoked the ire of the United States government. From the respite of 1956 to 1957, though, the Aoka were quick to reaffirm their position of fear and intimidation over the Cypriot population, though this time they had also ensured that commercial businesses would suffer, by proclaiming a boycott of British goods, with shopkeepers selling UK-made products being threatened with arson or bombing, while anyone seen using British goods, such as cigarettes, were liable for a vicious beating. This was coupled to a campaign of sabotage directed against minor pieces of infrastructure, such as electricity substations, public works equipment, including roadworks vehicles and excavators, and small police checkpoints and outposts, the damaged cause being of greatest inconvenience to the general public, whose taxes paid for the repairs. Although the security forces could use clusters and patterns of attacks to identify potential Aoka hotspots, and thus have more of their troops and officers stationed in these locations to ward off potential sabotage efforts. However, during 1958, two events would occur that would change the entire complexion of the Cyprus emergency, the first being when the Turkish town of Lefka erupted into violence following the rumoured murder of a Turkish couple in Nicosia by Aoka agents. While these reports were ultimately found to be untrue, the lie alone was enough to spark a wave of rioting by the Turkish population that saw Greek property burned and the Greek Cypriot citizens of the town forced to flee their homes. Greek evacuees spreading highly exaggerated stories to others on the island, the riots in Lefka had in fact been a massacre that had left dozens of Greek Cypriots dead. This only served to exacerbate the already brewing ethnic tension between the two population groups, leading to other Greek civilians marching into Lefka to fight the Turks with whatever weapons they could brandish resulting in the intervention of security forces by way of a roadblock in order to stop the confrontation before it turned fatal, the result of the Lefka riots being nearly £111,000 worth of damage to Greek property and £10,000 to Turkish property. Sadly, while the violence had been curtailed by the British, its lasting disruption of relations between the Turkish and Greek population was one that would linger, with physical splits in communities between Greeks and Turks turning what were once peaceful neighbours into sworn enemies and thereby rendered the Turkish community as a whole an Aoka target. Each ethnic group subsequently established their own home guard in order to protect against each other in the event of a surprise intercommunal attack by day or night, Aoka fashioning themselves as the Greek population's natural protector against the Turks, though many still preferred the presence of British soldiers and policemen to the right-wing thugs provided by Aoka. The Greek home guard, manned primarily by Aoka members, formed bomb groups who, armed with homemade grenades, could be called upon to attack Turkish targets in brutal fashion, while in response to the rise in Aoka's prestige, the Turkish population formed their own paramilitary organization known as the TMT, 
which operated in similar clandestine fashion in support of a Cypriot union with Turkey. The second major event that changed the face of the Cyprus emergency was the replacement of Field Marshal Sir John Harding as governor by Sir Hugh Foote, a former colonial administrator and one who believed in political resolutions rather than military ones for a crisis such as the Cyprus emergency, preferring behind-the-scenes diplomatic routes while maintaining the face of an active counter-terrorism operation. This led to the enactment of Operation Matchbox by the British Armed Forces, which was designed to be a visual illustration of Britain still retaining overall control of the situation in Cyprus, arresting and transferring to detention camps all known or suspected members of AOKA without trial, though such operations did little to curb AOKA's mission, as while many of their members were rounded up, hardline, high-ranking agents remained at large and generally invisible to the authorities through their hideaways in the mountains. The rise of Sir Hugh Foote to the position of governor was accompanied by the installation of Sir John Vincent Prendergast as new commander of the police special branch, Prendergast being an expert in intelligence with direct access to the governor, and effectively equal status with the commissioner of police and the army director of operations. In response to the riots in Lefka, Aoka sought revenge for the destruction of Greek property, and on July 30, 1958, launched an attack on a Turkish regional bus with grenades and shotguns that saw multiple people injured including women and children while one elderly man would later die of his injuries. The attack itself was thankfully not as severe as it could have been, due primarily to the homemade Aoka grenades failing to detonate, while one Aoka member blew his own hand off when the bomb exploded too soon, the assault team being subsequently rounded up by the British and prosecuted. The outward face of violence during the Cyprus emergency was set against the backdrop of behind-the-scenes diplomatic activity between the Greeks, the Turks and the British Empire a settlement finally being reached in which Cyprus would be granted independence under the government of Archbishop Makarios, with a predominantly Greek administration seated in power, but with constitutional safeguards protecting the rights of the Turkish minority. The British, meanwhile, maintained two large military facilities at RAF Akrotiri and Dekalia, and would be allowed to continue operations at these bases as sovereign assets of the British government, this accord being underlined with the requirement for an immediate ceasefire and an amnesty for political crimes committed during the emergency, the final death toll of the three-and-a-half-year crisis being 457 British personnel killed against 90 AOKA agents, while countless Cypriot civilians, either assassinated or caught in the crossfire, were also included among the dead. Although there were local celebrations to welcome home-released prisoners, public reaction to independence from the British was muted, with ethnic communities of Greeks and Turks having now been divided irreparably while both sides faced an uncertain future, with a majority Greek government now in place that was likely not to guarantee peace between the two factions in the long term. Right-wing Greek nationalist supporters, however, felt the agreement reached between the British, the Aoka, and Archbishop Makarios was a betrayal of their original goal of Enosis, Cyprus gaining its independence but not its union with mainland Greece. Grivas, who was expected to continue his guerrilla campaign against the sitting government to ensure Enosis was fulfilled, submitting to the agreement and ordering Aoka to lay down their arms, being paraded as a hero in the Greek capital of Athens, but just barely hiding his own sense of betrayal, at the final decision made as to the future of the island nation, other former members of Aoka exchanging their weapons for political capital, and intended to exploit the newly independent country to bolster their own personal wealth. More sceptical, however, were the Turks, who viewed the entire proceeding with great suspicion and an overwhelming sense of betrayal by both the British and their co-religionists on the mainland, the new constitution to protect the rights of the Turkish population only expected to work through the cooperation of the ethnic communities, which, as mentioned, had now been irreparably damaged as an outcome of the Cyprus emergency. Years of simmering resentment between the two sides would eventually lead to a bout of intercommunal violence in 1967, as stoked by the continued desire to see Enosis undertaken so as to unify Cyprus with Greece resulting in the formation of a new paramilitary nationalist group in the form of Aoka B, who sought to undertake a coup of the Greek Cypriot government in 1974 so as to unite the island administration with that of the military junta in Athens. This coup, however, gave rise to the threat of further ethnic violence against the Turks, while also presenting severe political ramifications should the Greeks be allowed to establish a vassal state directly south of mainland Turkey, thus leading to a full-scale invasion by Turkish forces that would result in the splitting of the island in two halves by way of a UN-brokered peace deal, leaving an unoccupied zone known as the Green Line, separating the Northern Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus and the Southern Republic of Cyprus, a status quo that remains to this day. In the end, the only beneficiaries of the Cyprus emergency were the British, 
as while they had lost their crown colony, the outcomes of the agreement meant they could maintain sovereignty over their bases at Akrotiri and Decalia, and thereby retain a presence in the wider politics of the Middle East and North Africa. The results of Aoka's terrorist campaign during the late 1950s being only to destroy the centuries-old ethnic communities of Turkish and Greek Cypriots. This ultimately turned what had once been overtly friendly neighbours into sworn enemies, now divided physically by a UN-monitored separation, truly the real victims of the Cyprus emergency being the people of this sun-kissed retreat in the eastern Mediterranean, with the long-abandoned farms, resorts, villas, and the international airport at Nicosia now being an everlasting reminder of what Aoka sought to achieve through the promise of Enosis but for what the average citizens would pay the price for.